so I'm excited about this message. Let me just say this to you this morning in the first service. Let me give you another praise report. The first service this morning, we had 15, mark it down, 15. New people that gave their hearts to Jesus this morning. Come on, give the Lord praise. Give the Lord the praise. We had a gentleman that came here that Dave Baldwin and also Murray came to get me after service. They came to track me down. And this gentleman was over here after service. And Murray and, and Dave said, hey, you got to meet this guy. So I went and met this guy. His name was Blackie. And he said, my name is Blackie. It's really John, but my name is Blackie. He said, I, I don't even know why I came here. He said, I drove by the church. And all of a sudden, the Lord, somebody just turned me into the parking lot. So here I am. And he said, I, I want to say thank you for all what you've done. I just moved here to the area. He said, today I gave my heart to the Lord. He said, I'll be at men's group this coming Thursday. Come on, to God be the glory. Isn't that awesome what God is doing? He just, uh, happenstance, just came in and drove into the driveway and gave his life to Christ this morning. I want to talk to you today about are you ready? Over these last few weeks, we've been talking about fears. Fears externally, External are things that we see and hear. When you see an accident, you have a fear of everybody okay. Or you hear a siren, you have that fear of man, something's wrong. Or internally, you have internal fears, like maybe you have bad nightmares, dreams. You have a, a, a feeling that something's eerie. That's an internal fear and external fear. But today, I want to talk to you about a conviction, a conviction, a fear about doing what's right, doing what's right, knowing what's right. So this fear that I want to talk about is knowing what's right and doing what's right in my life. If you have your notes, today I want to share about a fear or conviction we should have as believers. Now, the reason why I put that note down is this, conviction. Conviction does this. Conviction enlightens and makes visible those things in your life that you need to change. And it's up to you that that conviction that arises that you either change or don't change. That's what conviction does. It makes visible the things in your life that you need to change. Condemnation, on the other hand, does this. Condemnation brings shame, guilt to your life that you all of a sudden give up and quit because you don't think you're good enough. So God, he doesn't bring condemnation. He brings conviction and enlightens you to things in your life that maybe you need to change. In Proverbs 14, verse 27, I love what Solomon says, the wisest man on the planet. He says these words, the fear of the Lord. Now, he's talking about a fear of respect and awe and reverence to God. He's not talking about a fear that you run from, but you run to because you respect him, you honor God, and you put him in a place, like a position that, of authority in your life, that God, I respect you. He says, is a fountain of life. How many of you ever been to Yellowstone before? We took our kids to Yellowstone and we saw Old Faithful. How many of you ever got to see Old Faithful? Amen. And you sit there on the bench there at Old Faithful and you wait basically about every 15 minutes and all of a sudden the Old Faithful just erupts. And this huge fountain comes out of the ground. And when it's at its peak, it goes up 20 some feet high. All that water just erupts and it goes down 25 feet high. And man, people would, oh, ah, ooh, ah. They get excited because the water's spraying everywhere. And as it starts to weaken, the, 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 the height of that thing goes down slower and slower and slower till it stops. And then you wait another 15 minutes. Well, the fountain of life, what God is saying is that you have have a fountain of life in you, the more you draw closer to God, the more he draws closer to you. And the more you draw closer to him, God begins to fill you up with his presence, his power, his spirit to make you like a fountain. And what does a fountain do? If you go to a drinking fountain, a drinking fountain does what? It brings refreshing it quenches your thirst, and that's the same way with God. It brings refreshing. It brings renewal. It quenches your thirst in your life. So he says, it's a fountain of life. Well, watch this. Turning a person from the snares of death. So in other words, those who fear and reverence God and follow God with all your heart, it turns you away from the snare or the fear of death. What is death? The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. 
But the gift of God is eternal life. So what God is saying is, I'm turning you from the snares of death into life. And if you walk into sin, you're going to walk into death, and death leads to destruction in your life. So he says, listen, I'm turning the person, which is you, from the snares of death so that you can experience the fountain of life that I have for you. Listen, uh, as you as you note, it says this, a holy fear that brings us closer to God. That God, I have a respect in all of you that I want to come closer to you. How many want more of God and less of you? Amen. Well, that starts with having a holy respect, fear and respect of God. It says this, drawing closer to God. Watch this. And it says this. God keeps, where you, I don't know where you're at on that, a holy fear that brings closer to God and keeps us on track going home. Keeps us on track going home. And so in other words, God, I'm going to get closer to you, and it's going to keep me on track going home. What is that? Going home, being ready that my bags are packed when he comes to take me home. How many are ready? Got your bags packed and you're ready to go home and to be with the Lord? Amen. I don't know about you, but today we are so concerned about the changing or the things of the world, that changing the world and all its events. We're so concerned by all this. And believe me, I am too. But the only thing I know to do other than to pray is that, God, this is in your battle. The battle is not ours, it's yours. So the only thing I know to do in changing this world is not anything that I can fight, raise up again, but I can pray and believe and expect God because Jesus said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. Healing comes when people come back to God first and foremost, and then if we come back to God, then the healing of the land will take place. What we need is a a revival in our country that people come back to God, they come back to their first love and recognize and realize what they are doing is wrong and they repent and turn from their wicked ways. It only happens by the Spirit of God drawing them to their knees to God. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. So look at this, a holy fear, bringing them closer to God and keeps them on track. So I say this today that we're so concerned about the events of the world that sometimes we forget to take care of ourselves, that we forget to take care of ourselves. Let me ask you something. There are two types of people that God describes in our world, and he describes them in this way. He describes them as a Martha and as a Mary. There's only two types of people, a Martha. A Martha was always preoccupied, busy, always caught up with things that were going on around her that she never took time to be in the presence of God. Never took time to just be in the presence. She was so concerned and preoccupied by making sure this was right and this was right and doing this right that she forgot about taking time to be with God. Or there's the Mary that made her God first and foremost as a priority in her life. And because she made God the priority in her life, who got mad at her? Martha. And Martha went to Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you care? Martha, Mary won't even help me with any of the stuff that's going on around me. She was upset. She was angry. She was mad. And Jesus looked and said, Martha, Martha, why are you so troubled? Mary has chosen what is right and what is best. And in our lives, we can get so caught up with all the things around us that we forget about God. My father-in-law lived with us for five and a half years. Cheryl's mom lived with us for two weeks, and after she lived with us, she passed on. And then her father-in-law, my father-in-law lived with us for five and a half years after that. So in that five and a half years, he became weaker and weaker each year that passed. And because of that, I kind of became his caretaker. And I have a hard time taking care of myself, yet alone somebody else. Somebody say amen, right? And so I was his caretaker. And as he became weaker and weaker, he couldn't walk. He couldn't use the restroom, so I had to take him to the restroom. Sometimes he couldn't feed himself. And, you know, taking care of that, it took a lot of energy out of me. How many of you can relate to what I'm saying? You know, they say that people that burn out the most are nurses, doctors, lawyers, pastors, bartenders, of all things. It's always because they're giving out. They're giving out and not a lot of times receiving. But in caretaking a lot of times, you're so concerned about the needs of that person you're taking care of that sometimes you neglect your needs. 
then I was finding that my time being with God or whatever was being distracted because I was always taking care of Cheryl's dad or my father-in-law or Marvin. And in our lives sometimes we get so consumed about other things that are going on around us that it's distracting us from what matters most. And what matters most, are you ready with God? You see, listen, we are calling the world, the government, and the president to what? To raise their standards. How many know what I'm talking about? We're causing the man, the government, the president, the world, raise your standard. Where are your morals? Where is this? Where is that? Where and we're man, we're just man and just pouncing on that. That we gotta get this world together. We gotta get their act together. But look what this. But God is calling the church, not eventual church in general, but the church abroad, calling the church to raise ours. You see, this world won't change until we stand up first and foremost for God. The Bible says that don't you know that you are peculiar, different people. And how can people know that we are Christians or believers or, Christ, or Christ-like if we ourselves are acting like the world? The world will only follow what we do. They will only go as far as you go. So if your depth with Christ is very shallow, guess where the world will go? They'll be very shallow. But if we're boiling hot for God, that's why he said either you're hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spool you out of my mouth. But if you're hot for God, guess who's going to want to follow you? Because why? They're going to see something different, peculiar in your life. How does the world really want what you have if you're doing the same thing that the world is doing? What makes us any different just because I have the flagship that I say I'm a Christian that I boldly hey I'm a Christian that doesn't make us a Christian what makes us a Christian is that I have a commitment with Christ I'm calling the government the president to new standards but what about us you see in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 I love these verses of scripture he says there therefore If anyone is Christ, that's you and me. If anyone is in Christ, and I look upon this congregation today, and I know pretty much all of you, and pretty much all of you that I know, that, man, I know that you stand and you follow Christ, and that excites me. That excites me to know that I have a church that's full of a bunch of believers. Then when a bunch of believers get together, it's like when I was a kid, I used to collect fireflies, and I used to put them in a jar, get a bunch of them in there, and before you know it, it looked like a lantern, boom. Boom, boom, because those things kept flying, you know, lighting. And that's you. And I can see if your light's shining or if it's not, if you're flickering or, it's, or the, if the light's going out. But we are lightning bugs to the world. We bring hope to the world. Why? Because we're new in Christ. But he says this, the new creation has come. The new has come. Man, the new has come, that God has made you new. And God changes you from the inside out. He makes you new. He takes away the old things. That's why he said the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Now watch this. And it cuts away those things in your life that need to be cut away from. That's what the word of God does. It cuts away the old, the draw in your life to make you new. I remember when I was pastoring in Grand Junction, Colorado, and in Grand Junction, they have, man, great roses there. Everywhere you go, they're really prideful in Grand Junction about their roses. No kidding. Man, so anyways, when we got there, my wife said, honey, I want some roses, kind of like the Willy Wonka. I want a golden goose now, daddy. You know, but my wife said, I want some roses. Okay. So I went out and got some roses, and I planted those puppies in the first year. We got a few roses. But then the next year, we had a full bloom of these roses. And, I mean, they were pretty. I got some pink ones, some white ones, some red ones, laid them alongside my house, made that, planted them right there. It was beautiful. I was proud, right? And so, anyways, fall came. And that fall, you have to clip away the old and so that the new will come. So I clipped away, and I was so proud. And I brought over Jan. This name is Jan. Her name was, and she's a rose expert, right? So I said, Rose, Jan, I want you to check out my roses and see if I, how I did it. So she came out there, and the first thing she did is when she saw how I clipped my roses, she started laughing. And I mean to tell you, I got insulted. I was like, man, I'm going to give you the right hand of fellowship. What are you laughing? I got, man, look at these thorns that got me. I'm bleeding. I'm, she started laughing. I kid you not. 
I said, what's so funny? She said, you didn't clip those things. She took the shears. I'm not kidding you. She took the shears and clipped those things down almost to the ground. I said, you just killed my roses. She said, no, I didn't. And you know, the next year when those roses came up, I had more than I had that previous year because she said you have to clip away the old to bring in the new. And what God does in your life, he clips away the old lifestyle, habits, living in your life to bring in new. You see, God can only come in the area where it's an occupancy, where there's availability. If you ever go by a hotel, what do they say? No occupancy. What does that mean? Pass by because it's all full. And a lot of times in our lives, we are full that God can't do new in our lives. So how do you get full? The old has gone and the new has come. That God said the old, he clips away the old and brings in the new. And then verse 18, he says this, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know what that means? Reconciled means he restored. Reconciled means that God restored our breach or relationship with him, that God became the ultimate living sacrifice. He took upon our sins and he died for our sins because so that we and I could be bridge together back with God. It's like this. You're here. There's a bridge, which is Jesus, and God's over here. And Jesus was the bridge that made you be able to walk into fellowship with God. He reconciled you into your relationship again with God. Let me say amen to that. Aren't you glad with that? Praise the Lord that you are reconciled. Your relationship's been made new again. But then he goes on in verse 19. Watch this. That God was reconciling the world, you and me, to himself. Not counting people's sins against them. Not holding them against you. How many of you ever had this happen? People say they forgive you, and they forgive you until you face them again with maybe another struggle. And as soon as they, you're faced with another struggle or an opposition with those people, what do they have a tendency to bring up? Not only that struggle that you're facing right now, but they also bring up the struggle that you thought that they forgave you of. But you did this back then, and you did well, I thought that was forgiven. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. God doesn't do that. When God said he forgives you, he blots them out and he remembers them no more. He doesn't hold grudges against you. He doesn't bring up your past. He doesn't bring that up to you. He brings up your hope, your future, your life. And then he goes on to say, watch this, not holding people against their sin, them, and he committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20. We, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as you and I, as through God, we are making this appeal through us. We employ you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Make it right with God. God, make it right. Maybe in your life there's some areas in your life that you need to let go of. God can never be Lord of all if there's things in your life that you're holding on to that's not allowing him to be Lord of all. Then he goes on, verse 21, watch this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you ever think of the word righteousness with God, I always say that when I read that, it means I'm in right standing with God. Righteousness with God means that I'm in right standing with you. I don't have to have worry or fear or doubt of something going on that I know for certain if I die today, I go to heaven because I'm in right standing with God. But watch this. In verse 17, it talks about the new has come and the old is gone. God has taken our old way of thinking, our stinking thinking, our old way of thinking, living and doing as has given us a new hope, and a fresh start. God is taking that. So when God says he's made you new, he's transformed you by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 1, that God's taken away our stinking thinking, our thinking about, man, I want to get even with that person. I'm going to get this, that. I'm going to do this. All that stinking thinking, our living, man, the way we used to live, the things we used to do. I'm not part of the world. I'm of the world, but I don't have to be part of the world. I'm going to come out from among them and separate myself and touch no unclean things. I don't have to live as the world. Even though I live in the world, I don't have to be as the world. Sometimes in our lives, people can't tell if you're a Christian because you're acting just like them. Somebody say, ouch. It's true. And doing and having given a new hope 
and a fresh start. If you have your notes, watch this. A lot of us came to Christ because we didn't like, we didn't like our life and where it was going. How many can say amen to that? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound, right? I once was lost. I didn't like where I was going. I was going down the road to dead end. I was going down that road. I didn't like that avenue. We once were lost, didn't like where we were going. So can I ask you a question? So why are we going back? If you didn't like what you were doing before you came to Christ, then why do we have a tendency to go back to what we didn't like? A lot of times what happens is because we feel comfortable by doing what we normally know how to do or what feels good to us. Isn't that exactly what happened to Peter? Peter, he was a fisherman. He fished, and his whole family grew up as fishermen. He was an expert in fishing, so he was fishing for fish. So when Jesus called him in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, he said, Peter, come follow me then, and I will make you fishers of men. And so here was Peter. He transformed from being a fisher, fisher, to now fishers of men. And now all of a sudden he's walking this walk with God, man, telling people about Jesus, man, reconciled to Christ, relationship renewed, his life renewed, and all of a sudden persecution rose up. Man, all of a sudden all this hardship rose up. And what did Peter do? Peter's first thing when he got with the disciples, what did he do? He went back to what is comfortable and he said to his disciples, I'm going fishing. And a lot of times what happens when we're faced with opposition, pressures, and things in our life, we run back to our old way of life thinking that that's going to bring comfort to us. When it really is leading to destruction, despair, and agony, and hurt in your life. Somebody say amen. Right? Now watch this. He says, if you have your notes, I love this. God has something new. When God has something new, check this out. God has something new, a new mindset. What do you mean a new mindset? How we used to think and what we used to do. He has a new mindset, new way of thinking, new way of living, new attitude. New attitude about life, others, and even yourself. That I have a new attitude. That attitude is that I am a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away and all things become new. I have a new outlook on life. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm chosen royal priesthood, the people belonging to God. I'm special in the eyes of God. I have a new attitude. I love this. New opportunities. A new opportunity for a fresh start, a clean slate, and I love this, and a forgiven past. I'm forgiven. Now I have a reason for living. Jesus keeps giving and giving. Right? I have a reason for living because I'm forgiven. I don't have to be the sway back donkey and carry my past and my yesterdays because I can walk into my news that God has for me. He's given me new opportunities, new starts, new beginning. But here's another one. A new lifestyle. Sometimes we need to change our clothes. When God called out Lazarus from the tomb, he called him by name. And when Lazarus came out of the tomb, you know what the first thing that Jesus said to Lazarus? Lazarus, take off those grave clothes. Some of you need to take off your grave clothes. Grave clothes mean death. Grave clothes mean maybe sin. Grave clothes mean pain. Grave clothes, you need to take them off and start changing your clothes. Watch what he said. Not doing the things that you, you do hurt others. Maybe you need to change. They strike me, I'm going to strike them, I'm going to get them back. I'm not going to get even, I'm going to get them back. And even hurt your future. How many of you lost things because of what you've done? Maybe you lost opportunity. Maybe you lost a promotion. Maybe you lost your marriage because of things that you've done. Watch this. You're a new person. A new person in Christ. If you're a new person, so we need to live like one. 
Somebody say, ouch. ouch. It's true. We need to live like I'm someone special, that I'm renewed, that I'm born again, my past is forgiven, my future is ahead of me, and I'm going to live like it. Amen? Proverbs 26, verse 11, watch what he says. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. In other words, a dog returns back to his mess. How many of us turn back to our mess? How many of us turn back to our things that we feel comfortable about when we're supposed to stand up? We're demanding the world to change and raise its standards. But God is saying to the church, church, rise up. This world cannot be changed if we don't start with the church. It has to start with us. But sometimes, you know what happens when I get with a group of people? Man, we complain just as well as the church, the world complains. And you know what? Bad company corrupts good character. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And so many times we want to be like the peanut gallery. We want to chime in. Why don't we sprinkle in that, man, we need God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. I know, I know that I know that I know that, Renee, I could stand up here. Trust me. I could stand up here, and I could, man, toot my horn. People get mad at me because, why don't pastors stand up for this? I hear that all the time. Well, let me tell you something. I'd rather point you to Jesus than point you to that mess. And I'm going to tell you why. Do I care about that stuff? Absolutely I care about that. But, you know, I know that the only way I can see change is on my knees, if my people. Why don't we do less talking and more praying? Come on. Hear what I'm saying. In the book of Acts, they talk about Gabriel. Don't you remember Gabriel? He led a band of people in revolt, and he came up against all of us, and it came to nothing. But if Paul and Silas, if they're for real and if it's from God, we're not going to be fighting them. We're going to be fighting their God. I'm here to tell you today, we need to get connected with God. We need to be the church and rise up and be the church, not just talkers, but be walkers for him and that people see a difference, that we are going to be world changers. Why? Because I'm new in Christ. I'm not going to walk in that mess. I'm going to lift you up from that mess and point you to Jesus, and Jesus will do the transformation in your life that you will change, and if we can change one by one, this world will be changed. It starts with us. Come on. Is that not right? I know it sounds hard, but it's true. But check this out. There's three ways that we always turn back to our vomit. Check this out. Believers turn back to their old ways, number one, when under pressure. Maybe you're under financial pressure. Maybe you're going through some pressures in your life. And so because of that pressure, it's so painful right now, and God doesn't jump into your boat right away. So you go find a false comfort. You mask your pressure. You mask your pressure with other things. I know, because before I met Christ, I did the same thing. That's the first thing. Another one is this, for my facing struggles. God, if you love me. Why do I go through this? And if you, God, love me, you care about me, and you let me go through this, you must not love me. So forget this. I'm going back to my old ways. Here's another one, the third one, big one. Even peer pressure. He or she is doing it, and I respect them, and I love them, and I follow them, and, man, I, I look up to them, and if they're doing it, it must be okay. I mean, you can hear what I'm talking about. I know it's hard today, but my role as a pastor is to point you to Jesus. And so many times we're so concerned about all these other events. Are you a Mary or are you a Martha? Man, Martha, all she wants to do is talk and complain, but don't do anything about it. We got to get real with God. Say, God, I'm going to start. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. Could you imagine if the church across the world will get on fire for God and start seeking his face and turning from their wicked ways? You don't think the world's going to change? 
when Lot went before Solomon and Gomorrah, he said, man, can you find ten people that are holy in that place? Came down to one family. Can you find one person? Couldn't find one. You think God wanted to smite that? He was making a point. They're not ready for me to come. They're not holy. They're not living the standards that they should be living. God is calling the church to rise up. You see, listen, God calls us fools because how can we walk away from what's good and return to the old? I can't even fathom that. The money that I'm saving from all the stuff that I did, whoo I could buy a new car. I like country western music. I get my house back, get my job back, get my wife back, get my kids back. I get it all back. And the dog. <laughs> Amen. Watch this. Check this out. God is very concerned about our world and its conditions. I'm going to tell you right now. You don't think God hurts by what he sees going on around us? But you know what? What God does do? He tells his church, is this not signs of my return? Is this not signs of what I'm telling you is going to take place before I come? So are we going to be so focused on that or are we going to be focused on God? Because when God comes, are we ready? Listen, but he's more concerned about you. He's so concerned. God is a jealous God. He doesn't want any to perish. That's why he left the 99 and went after the one because he wants none to perish. He's so concerned. He loves you. He's infatuated with you. This world is going to vaporize, going to go away. But you will live forever in heaven or in hell. And he's concerned about you and your destiny of where you will be when he comes. Somebody say amen. We are so concerned about what's going to happen in our world that we forget to take care of ourselves. We forget to take care of you. Real quickly in Matthew 24, verse 36 and 34, watch this. I'm just going to blow right through that. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. No one knows. But look what he says. As it was in the day of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. No one knew. They laughed at Noah. They ridiculed Noah. They put Noah down. You're crazy. It's a drought. You're in the middle of a desert building the boat. What is wrong with you? For the days before the flood... People were eating, drinking, and marrying, and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. In other words, they were about their business. Not preparing, not ready, got all consumed about all the other things instead of what matters most. Can you get it? You get it? And they knew nothing about what was happened until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Watch this. Verse 40. Two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Verse 41. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Verse 40. Therefore, keep watch. Be in season, out of season. Folks, let's not become lazy. You're almost to the finish line. You're almost there. We older people, man, we're probably three-fourths of the way there. It's not a time to quit or to give up. It's a time to press in to the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm not going to forfeit all what I worked for over these last 40 years of my life. It's not a time to quit. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Because... Understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Somebody say amen to that. You've been ready for that, robber, wouldn't you? Some of you got artillery. Man, you got so many guns in your house. I know, man. I've been in some of your houses. I love those safes you got. Man, you could put a gun in every window. Protect your house. So you also must be ready. 
Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Oh, am I ready? The thing that we should fear the most is, are you ready? Prepared? And are your bags packed? I want you to write this down in, in Matthew 13. Matthew 13. It gives you all the descriptions about how God is coming. It tells you in many, many different ways that the kingdom of God is like this and the kingdom of God is like that. You read it for yourself and then decide what, when are you. Are you ready? The fear of saying, are you ready? For the sake of time, Donnie, we're just going to jump down. And forget Matthew 25, 1 through 13. I want to just go each day with the Lord is walking out your salvation, your life, and your heart with him. Each day. Each day. We should examine our hearts. God created me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. God, make sure that I'm right with you. Our thoughts, our motives, to see if they line up with God. Each day is a time to forgive, a time to love, and a time to accept each other. Each day. God, that person sometimes is unlovable, but... I'm going to make a choice to love them anyways. Verse 10, it says it's too late. From Matthew 25, this is coming from. When he comes, there will be no more waiting. There will be no more waiting. Time's up. No more bargaining. God, I'll give you this. God, I'll give you my heart. God, I'll surrender. It's too late. And no more forgiving. It's over. I don't know about you, but I love watching movies. But I, when I watch movies, this, and I don't normally promote a movie, but I love it anyways. If you want to see a good movie, a true story, just watch it. It's called The Twelve Orphans. It's a true story. Incredible movie, The Twelve Orphans. But either a movie, when you watch a movie, there's two things that happen. Either you love the ending. How many can relate to what I'm talking about? Either you love it or you hate the ending. How I many know what I'm talking about? I love the ending of this movie. And if you rent it, make sure you wait till the end and watch all of it as it plays out. When he comes, huh, I'm going to say this. What will your ending look like? Will you love it or will you hate it? I as your pastor, I have a responsibility. And let me tell you something. I bleed with this responsibility of knowing that I'm your shepherd. And if I didn't tell you about Jesus, I'd be missed. So how do you get ready? Real quick. Number one, make him Lord of your life. Got to become Lord and Savior of your life. Number two, repent of any sins from today or your past. God, I turn from my wicked ways. I repent. I do an about face. Forgive the ones who need to be forgiven. Forgive them. Stop doing things that you know hurt him. I have to stop at this point real quick. Have you ever made anything in your life? Let's say you did and I come along and destroy that which you just made. Some of you would probably shoot me, kill me, get mad at me, cuss me out, whatever else, because I destroyed something you were proud of. When you do things that hurt the temple. The Bible says, don't you know that you are a temple of God and God's spirit lives in him. He destroys God's temple. God destroy him. Every time we do something to destroy our temple, you're hurting God. I don't want to hurt God. Be obedient to his ways and not your own. To obey is better than a sacrifice. Disobedience brings curses. Obedience brings blessings. Let him find you. This is, this is the church today. This is where I bleed. Jamie, this is where I bleed. Let him find the church, you living, serving, and loving one another. I ask you this. The date of your trip, the date of your trip is almost here. Are you ready? Will you stand with me this morning? Are you ready? 
I'm going to do the same thing. I'm not going to call you forward. But I want you to say this. If you would die today, do you know for certain you'd go to heaven? If you can't answer that question 100% assured, then maybe you need to make it right. Another thing is if you would die today and you would stand before Jesus and you'd say to you, why should I let you into my kingdom? What are you going to say? Because you've been a great person. It's not by works that you've been saved. It's by grace. Not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. My role as a pastor is to point you to greener pastors. And it all starts by accepting Jesus. So I want you to bow your heads. Please, no one looking around like last week. I'm not going to call you forward. But you say, Pastor, I need to make it right with God in my life. I need to make sure my bags are packed. There are things in my life I need to surrender and submit to God. Fifteen this morning in the first service gave their hearts to Jesus. But that's you. I'm not going to call you forward. And you say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. Just say, Pastor, yes, look at this. Wow. Just keep them up so I can see. Wow. Wow. Nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16, 17, thank you. Got two hands up over there. Anyone else? 17, thank you. Two more just put in. 18, 19, 19 people. Anyone else? Yes, in the back, 20. Man, 20 people. Anyone else? 21, just another one just going up. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to count to three. Don't miss this time. Is your bag's ready? One. Anyone else? You say, Pastor, pray for me. 21 people. Yes, 22 in the front. Two. Anyone else? Three. Will you do me a favor? Will you all look at me now? 23 people just raised their hand. Did you see it? Pastor Andrew. 23 people. Come on. Is what I want to do. We're going to corporately close in prayer. Because I don't want you to know the person that raised their hand because it's a sacred time. But we're going to pray this together. And I'm going to tell you, I'm so stinking proud of you. Man, if you feel my heart right now, I love you guys so much. I know that, man, if God will come today, I know now you're going to be with me. And I'm going to be with you. But I want us to pray this all together. Your pastor is so proud of you that raised your hand. I pray to God that you know how much this pastor loves you. I love you so much. Man, and I want to see us all, Adventure Church, have a reunion in heaven together at the coffee shop with Rhonda and Jeff Miller. Amen. Will you pray just with me today? Will you, all of us, pray together? Sometimes we need, all need a checkup from the neck up. Amen. Will you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Forgive me of my wrongs, my faults, and my failures, and my sins. Today I make you Lord and Savior of my life. I surrender to you, and I pick up the cross and follow you. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery, but today is a gift, the gift of salvation, of hope, and a renewed life with you. I give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, now come on, give the Lord praise. 23 people, 15, 38 new people giving their hearts to Jesus this morning. I think we need to give God the glorious praise. Come on, don't patty cake them. Shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Woo! I want to say God bless you today. And I pray, Jamie, man, that you know that this pastor loves you. God bless you. Make sure you check out the auction. We love you in Jesus. God bless you. We would like to thank you for joining us for service this week. Adventure Church is a tool within God's toolbox that He is using to further His kingdom. If you have been blessed by this ministry, please consider giving. 
Your generous donation will ensure we're able to continue to provide these online services many people have come to rely on. You can find a safe and easy giving link within the description of this video or one of these three options you see here. Thank you in advance for your generous donation.